things are true Whatever things are just Whatever things are honest things Hello, this is uh, part three of the series How Gnosticism or Greek Philosophy Has Poisoned the Christian Church. In uh, part two I started explaining what is the core uh, thinking, the main thinking of Gnosticism or Greek philosophy. And the main problem of this, this world outlook is that they see the material world and being physical as uh, evil, uh, as something that you don't want or want to escape from, or maybe it's a learning school, but that the the, the purpose of living is uh, in the end to uh, to reach a, a spiritual state where you will live forever in the spiritual world. And there are all kinds of this uh, Gnostic uh, ID. The idea that you will live forever in heaven or in paradise or the eternal hunting ground or Valhalla or uh, Nirvana. There are all different ideas and they all have the same concept that the purpose of life is to attain a eternal spiritual state of, uh, of being and that state is described as blissed and uh, very uh, desirable. But I already explained that is totally not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the purpose uh, God had for mankind was to rule on earth forever in his uh, likeness and his image. And just because mankind has lost this likeness of God in insight by uh, eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, there has to be a special measure from God uh, we call it being born again or being recreated being a new creation like uh, first current second current 15 teaches us whosoever is in Christ is a new creation all things are all old things are past the see the new has come all things have become new so that's all expressions of this this uh, born again being born again and in part one i explained that the new covenant of god uh, talks about this recreation or being born from above or born again there are different ways of uh, approaching the same idea that the old man uh, the old man of sin will be crucified in Christ so that whosoever believes in Christ and is baptized in Christ his old man will die in the be, being crucified and he will raise in eternal life so that's uh, the core idea of the gospel but Greek philosophy is isn't about being born again or being a new creation it's not about being suited for uh, to rule as a representative of God on this earth. Gnosticism is about reaching an eternal uh, state of an eternal spiritual state. Um, and there are different um, ideas how to reach that, uh, that state, but the core idea is still the same. Being physical is bad and being spiritual is good. Now also in the in the, the time of Jesus there was there was already a group of Jews um, we must remember that the uh, Israel and most of the Jews had been living under under Greek uh, rule for uh, 400 years and uh, even more when the Romans took over the Greek empire the dominant culture, the language, the philosophy was still Greek language, Greek philosophy. So also the Jews were uh, influenced uh, by this. And 
um, because this 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 concept that um, being material is bad and being spiritual is good there are different schools um, that all have the same core belief and one of the schools that uh, Jesus had a problem with was the school of the Sadducees and the Sadducees were uh, 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 actually a Gnostic sect within uh, within Israel and most of them they belong to the dominant uh, priesthood so uh, most of the of the priests and the high priests were of this this uh, this belief you must remember that um, actually the temple of Herod where these priests were uh, serving was nothing was very nice and very beautiful but it was nothing like just an empty shell because in the whole in the holy place the holy of holies I don't know how you say that in English where in the time of uh, Salomo there stood the Ark of the Covenant the Ark of the Covenant was gone and we don't know exactly when it when it uh, left uh, the area but uh, probably from the destruction of the first temple by Nebuchadnezzar there's no mention that they 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 moved everything every uh, valuable things from the temple they moved them uh, to Babylon but there's no mention of the Ark of the Covenant and it was all covered in gold and uh, so it was a very precious item so probably the ark of the covenant was already gone by that uh, by that time but we have no uh, no mention in the bible where it has gone to so this temple of herod where these priests were functioning was actually nothing more than an empty shell and their whole religion and the offerings were also an empty shell when God spoke about the new covenant he was going to make with Israel and Judah he also mentioned that the uh, the new covenant would not be like the old covenant which they had already broken so Jeremiah 31 starting from verse 31 behold the days come says the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with our fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my which my covenant they break although I was an, hus an husband unto them says the Lord so God declares already in Jeremiah that the old covenant was already broken and uh, this is in opposition to strange doctrines that go around that the old covenant was in place until the destruction of the temple of Herod in 70 uh, uh, AD but the, co the old covenant was already broken so the new covenant started when Jesus shed his blood on the cross um, um, but that is a, a side path so we see that the old covenant was actually already gone and the whole uh, priesthood and the whole situation of priesthood was already an empty empty shell so uh, most of the priests were uh, uh, part of this uh, this uh, sect of the Sadducees and the Sadducees uh, rejected the whole idea of the resurrection of the dead and of course that that's part of this Gnostic philosophy because to to a Gnostic uh, to a Gnostic or Greek philosophy being in the flesh being in the body is, is terrible it's a it's a it's a punishment it's it's a hell on earth <laughs> <laughs> it is not what you what you desire but the Sadducees they had uh, a different opinion than most Gnostics and they they learned that after death you when your body was uh, gone you just 
uh, didn't exist anymore. More like uh, modern uh, sci so-called uh, scientists uh, who believe that when you cannot see it with your physical uh, uh, eyes, it doesn't exist. So the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. And then we see uh, they, they try to confront uh, Jesus with that. We go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew, 20, Matthew chapter 22. And when we read from verse 23, we see this confrontation with, between Jesus and the Sadducees. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brothers, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with her seven brethren, and the first when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seven. And, uh, and last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. So the Sadducees, they, they thought, well, we catch uh, Jesus on this law of Moses. That uh, the whole concept of the resurrection of the dead uh, poses a lot of, uh, so many problems that it's impossible to to fathom even the ID. But Jesus answered, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So here you see that Jesus is defending the concept of the resurrection of the dead. And this is not a spiritual resurrection, this is talking about a physical resurrection of uh, people who were once dead but are resurrected in a, a, a body, in a bodily form. And probably Jesus is referring that it will be a different bodily form than they had before because he said uh, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angel of God in heaven. Uh, that is not to say that they have a spiritual body like the angels, but that they no longer do, um, how do you call it? No longer have uh, a procreate, I think. <laughs> no longer have, to have children, they do, do no longer have uh, sex because there's no, no need to produce children anymore in this uh, resurrected, eternal, indestructible body. Um, this is also a verse to counter the idea that angels can have sex with uh, uh, earthly human uh, women and produce uh, children uh, with them because angels have spiritual bodies and they do not procreate at all. And God never gave them the power to procreate like he gave to human beings when he said to them, multiply and fill the earth in Genesis 1. God never said that to angels, but that is a side path also. So you see here Jesus um, defending uh, the idea of the concept of resurrection and like I told Gnosticism hates the idea of res resurrection in a physical body because gnot Gnostics they prefer either that you disappear completely or that you will live forever in a spiritual 
a world and a spiritual body, but not in a physical body. Uh, though the whole idea of being in the flesh, it's, it's, it's terrible for Gnostics. Gnostics. But here, um, in this confrontation with the Sadducees, we see uh, Jesus confronting actually Gnostic philosophy, Greek philosophy. And it centers around the, uh, the concept of the resurrection of the dead. Now, the resurrection of the dead is a core teaching, a core uh, doctrine of the, of the early Christian church. And you should ask yourself the question, how many sermons do you hear in your, in your church about the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the dead? How many sermons do you hear about it? I think most Christians, even in a lifetime in church, never hear a sermon on the resurrection of the body. And this is also a proof uh, how deep Gnostic thinking and Greek philosophy has uh, yeah, drenched the, the whole Christian church. But we will now um, examine how important uh, the doctrine of uh, resurrection of the body uh, is in the Bible. First we go to the Gospel of John. And we start off in John 5, verse 29. We start in verse 25 to have the, the context clear. John 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, when Jesus says ver verily, verily, he knows that those who are listening will have a hard time uh, understanding what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So this is already talking about the resurrection of the dead, because they are dead, but still they hear the voice of the Son of God, and those of the dead that hear that, they shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute, execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not as this, at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. So, people uh, have not disappeared when they die, like the Sadducees and, and, uh, and many other Greek philosophers think that after you die you, just, you are just gone. Because, because Jesus is talking about all that are in the graves and they shall hear his voice. So <laughs> when you are in the grave, ex I presume your body is dead but your soul, your spirit, are still hearing the voice. So shall, shall hear his voice, and then, this is the resurrection of the dead, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So, in the resurrection of the dead, there will be two paths. One is to what Jesus called life, but the other path is not to disappearing and being dissolved into nothing. It's about resurrection of damnation. Damnation means judgment, eternal judgment. That's what Jesus is talking about. So this is one of the, uh, the verses where Jesus himself is speaking about the resurrection of the dead. Now here in this verse you can uh, assume, and I think that's right to do that, that this is um, pointing to the resurrection before uh, the great white throne in Revelation. Let's go to Revelation. I thought 
it with Revelation 20. And we start Revelation 20, we start from verse 4. And I saw thrones, and I sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And then verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So there's a group of people that will have a part in a first resurrection. So there are different resurrections. When there is a first, then there will be a second also. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. So besides we have more than one resurrection, we also have more than one death. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this points that this first resurrection is at a the, at the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. When Jesus returns to earth, then there will be a group of people that uh, has been uh, has stayed loyal to Jesus and has not fallen for the, the, the philosophy of the beast, which is actually Greek philosophy and Greek thinking. But there's a group that will uh, be resurrected and will reign with uh, Christ for a thousand years. Now this, this reign for a thousand years is on earth. We re read that in Revelation 5. Resurrection 5 verse 10. And he has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So this group of resurrected people will reign on earth. Now to reign on earth you need a body. You need a physical body. Without a physical body you can have no interaction with the, with the physical earth. In heaven you don't need a, need a body at all. So there's no need for a resurrection to get to heaven. Um, so this group people will be resurrected, they, they died because before it says they were beheaded. Now usually when you are beheaded you die. I don't know many people who are beheaded and still live on. Uh, uh, when I was young I, I saw this when, my, when a neighbor of us started beheading his chickens, that the chickens... <laughs> <laughs> used to run for a while before they fell down <laughs> but e eventually even the chickens without a head died and ended up in the soup but <laughs> for most people when you are beheaded it's over straight away so these people were beheaded so they had died but they were partakers of the first resurrection so they had a new body the whole idea is loathsome to Greek philosophies and philosophers and Gnosticism. So they shall reign with Christ for a thousand years. We read it will be on earth and it will be in a physical body. And then the thousand years are expired. Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And I went up on the breadth of the earth. So this battle is not in heaven. It's not in the spiritual uh, realm. It's a battle on earth, in a physical battle and compass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So that means that these saints will be on earth in a physical body. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's also proof that this 
battle is on earth because when it's not on earth but in the spirit fire does not need to come down <laughs> and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and there shall be tormented day and night forever and ever verse 11 and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and then verse 12 and i saw the dead small and great stand before god and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to the works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them so this is clearly uh, talking about the second resurrection not the resurrection to life but the resurrection to damnation where Jesus spoke about in John 5 and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death so to, to die a second time you have to be resurrected <laughs> you cannot die two times just without being resurrected in uh, in between and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire so they also experienced the second death what is called the second death so this uh, doctrine about the resurrection of the body and the resurrection of the of the dead is a core doctrine of Christianity we will see more of that uh, for example we go to John 11 that is the story about the resurrection of Lazarus John 11 uh, friend of, uh, of a friend of Jesus last called Lazarus uh, died and uh, Jesus uh, tarried long enough to be sure that he was uh, really dead and not uh, just a few minutes because of what he was uh, going to do and then the sisters of Lazarus, they come to Jesus and they complain, if, if you had been here more early, Lazarus would not have died. And Jesus shows that dying is nothing to him. Death has no power uh, on him and death has no power around him. So whether somebody is sick or dead, it's no difference to Jesus. Where Jesus is, the sick will be healed where Jesus is the dead will be raised um, so John 11 we start from verse 21 then said Martha unto Jesus Lord if thou hadst been here my brother had not died that's a rebuke but I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God God will give it to thee so she believed that when Jesus asked God that death would not be no problem. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Then Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's the resurrection we read about in Revelation 20. So this concept of the resurrection on the last day was not new. Uh, Remember that the book of Revelation was not written yet <laughs> when Jesus was talking to Martha. So the whole concept of the resurrection of the dead was already known and familiar to the Jews. And um, Martha was not a scholar, she was not a Pharisee, she was not a Sadducee, she was, uh, she was not uh, a teacher of the scriptures, she was just a woman and uh, she knew this whole concept of the resurrection of the last day where we just read about so she is sh she is uh, sure about uh, the resurrection of Lazarus 
in the, in the last uh, judgment and trust that he will res resurrect uh, on the in the right way that he is risen in the written in the book of life because he believes in Jesus but then Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life he that believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die believe thou this so Jesus is, is explaining to Martha, death has no power over me and those who believe in me, death will have no power over them. And even when they, are they have died, they shall live. She said unto him, Yeah, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So, um, in this discussion, we see that the resurrection of the dead is, a, is an important doctrine that was familiar to the Jews living in the days of Jesus. And Jesus gives a promise about the re reality of this resurrection. Of course, then we know the end of the story that uh, Jesus calls Lazarus uh, out of the grave. Um, we don't know we assume that Lazarus uh, died uh, later, we are not sure about that. There are some uh, stories about the whereabouts of Lazarus, but they are not in our Bible, so it's difficult to control them on their authenticity. So we rather not uh, speak about it. But if Jesus was agnostic, if Jesus uh, had Greek philosophy, he would have rejoiced about uh, Lazarus being dead and would have explained to, to, to uh, Martha, like, well, don't be sad. You know, Lazarus is now a little star in heaven. And when you look up to the stars, then you can see Lazarus there in heaven and you can talk with him because he is in heaven. and. Everything is well with him now, he is safe, he's not suffering anymore, he is in the presence of God and for eternally rejoicing. Jesus does not do this. Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect representation of God on earth, shows by the resurrection of Lazarus that being in the body is not bad. Being in the body is good. It's what God wants. If God don't want us to live in a body, if God wants us to live in heaven forever, he would not have resurrected any dead. He would have said, okay, now you're dead. Now you have reached your destination. <laughs> Everything is okay. Don't pay, uh, pay a dollar to, to, uh, to every Christian in the world that believes that being dead and being in the grave, you're better off than, uh, than being alive you'll be poor before you know it. So here in John, in John 11, we also see this, this, this concept of resurrection of the, of the dead bodies is a core doctrine that even Jesus taught about. Then we go to Acts, the book of Acts, and we first go to Acts chapter 1. In Acts uh, chapter 1 they have a discussion because Judas uh, Iscariot has gone and they are no longer with 12 uh, disciples and I feel that's not right. They should be with 12 apostles and they will choose uh, uh, another man to be one of the 12. So, so the number 12 will be complete again. And then they talk about um, what is necessary for someone to, to be one of the 12 apostles. In uh, Acts 1, we start from verse 21, they talk about who they will choose. Wherefore of these men which have company, accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, 
beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So to be a witness of the resurrection of Jesus and knowing Jesus from the beginning, one that has walked with, with the apostles and have walked with Jesus from the start of his ministry, and his ministry started when he was baptized by, by John. So there are more people besides the twelve that uh, walked and talked with Jesus and were there all the time. And they find uh, two persons, but the, mo the so the, the main criteria are knowing Jesus, having been with them and walked with them all the time, even when other people uh, stopped following Jesus and uh, everything. And to be, and that's one criteria, and the other one is to witness of the resurrection of Jesus. So here you say that the main reason why someone has been spoken that he is qualified to be a trustworthy witness of the resurrection of Jesus. And many Gnostics say, say that the resurrection of Jesus was not real and that he's not really resurrected from the dead. But it's so clear from our Bible that the resurrection of Jesus was a physical a resurrection of a physical body uh, out of the grave. And we, we, we come to that. And also in the, in the um, when we start to read in Acts 2, this is a story about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And we know that the apostles and other people that were with them in the upper chamber, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and started to speak in other tongues. And there was a lot of noise and strange things happening. And all the Jews that were gathered together in Jerusalem because of the, the feast they had to uh, uh, follow and uh, celebrate in Jerusalem, they were and they flocked all together. They saw all these strange things and then Peter gives his first uh, open um, sermon. is uh, speaking the, the gospel. Uh, Peter doesn't need to ex explain about the crucifixion of Jesus because they all know about the crucifixion. He is not uh, explaining any doctrine about, well, Jesus took your place and Jesus took your sins and Jesus suffered instead of you. He is uh, pointing straight toward the, the Jews that were gathered together, that they were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus and that, uh, but that it was all in the, in the, in the plan of God. But then the, the, the core of his sermon is about the resurrection, not about the crucifixion, not about the work that has, done, that has been done on the cross. The core of his preaching is on the resurrection of the dead. We read from Acts 2 verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain and then whom God had raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it for David and then Peter starts to to give scriptural evidence that it was prophesied uh, beforehand in what we call the Old Testament but there's nothing old about it for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Ne that is 
not the, the lake of fire, but that's the Gehenna, that's the, the place where the, the souls of the dead were contained before the resurrection. Neither wilt thou suffer this holy one to see corruption. The corruption is speaking about the physical body. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And then, man and brother, let me free, freely speak, speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchral, sepulchral, sepulchral is with us unto his days. So, Peter explained that this verse cannot uh, be speaking about David himself, but that David is prophesying about the coming Christ, about the coming Messiah. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, not left in the Gehenna, neither his flesh did see corruption. So here he explains that it's not about a spiritual resurrection, but it's spirit and soul that are joined together. This Jesus has got raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Peter starts to explain that with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus, God proves that he is the, the Messiah. He is the Christ that was prophesied. He is the one to, the, to, to deliver uh, uh, all of Israel. And when people are the convinced, where are they convinced of? They are not convinced of the crucifixion. They are uh, not even that uh, the work on the cross, which is expounded on, on, on in most churches, uh, Peter doesn't speak about that. Peter speaks about the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the dead. And that is proof that Jesus is the Christ. And it's also proof that the resurrection of the dead is not just a vain uh, imaginary idea, but it's, it's a reality. It's a reality in Christ. And when the, the Jews hear this, then they are touched in their heart. Then they are convinced that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Christ. And then they ask, what shall we do? And then they get baptized and, uh, and everything. So you see that the core of the message that, is, that Peter is delivering in Acts is the message of the resurrection of the body, which once again is a hateful idea for Gnostics and for Greek philosophy. And we will see that when we continue in this Bible study. But I guess uh, this part is long enough now. And so I close this off and we will continue this in part four. See you then. Things are pure. Whatever things are love.